Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. As you can tell, we are trying something new. We are going to be broadcasting uh, the morning and the evening services to you. Just give a couple of quick announcements. Um, all the activities at the church are canceled until further notice. So just please uh, wait. We'll get word out to you either via email, Facebook, um, the website, many different ways. Please check the, um, the website for the latest announcements and our Center View Facebook page. We do try to keep you informed that way. And we are emailing you as well. One of the things we're going to do in the next week or so is to try to call uh, every person in our church roster to verify your information and to get prayer requests and to see how we can help you. So be expecting a call from either one of the pastors or from one of the deacons. Uh, this is the evening service, so just to let you know, every Sunday morning we're going to be doing the adult Sunday school classes via Zoom. Your Sunday school teacher should have sent you an email on how to do that, and we're going to try to tweak that for the teens as well. For the children, uh, your Sunday school teachers should be sending you some email and some help, things that you can find. I know that uh, Lifeway has some resources that are available to you as well. Also on Sunday mornings, the Panera bread that we normally have will be available from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Brother Robert will be there. Uh, please come and get what you need, um, and we'll uh, ensure that, that that gets taken care of. If you do have any prayer requests, feel free to call the office or send an email to our secretary at cbcsecretary uh, at gmail.com. Uh, if you need anything at all, contact the church office, myself, Pastor Mike, or one of your deacons. We are here to help. Just because we're not meeting in a building does not mean that we uh, can't meet each other's needs and that we do not care. All right, well, I'm going to go right into our missionary in focus today. Uh, look at our verse. Um, we're going to do a prayer talk about, oh, by the way, before we do that, I want to talk about giving. Um, if you, uh, we still have bills to pay, we have missionary support, those kinds of things, mor mortgage to pay, you can give online. You'll see there on the bottom left, uh, online giving. You can mail your check into the church. Uh, our address here is 1165 Piney Green Road, Jacksonville, 28546. You can drop by the church office also during the week. Uh, if you want to just do that, just Please give us a call first to make sure that we have somebody here. Our missionaries in focus tonight are Artemio and Josie Robles. They are serving in the Philippines. Uh, continue to pray for them uh, as the Philippines is also dealing with this pandemic, plus all the other issues that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Proverbs 19.17 is our verse focus for the month. It says, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what he's given. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to use technology to continue to meet the needs of our church. We pray for each and every member, Father, that you would just give them calm during this time, help them to learn to trust you even more. Help us to reach out uh, as individuals of the church to those most in need, to our elderly, to those who are sick, to those who are shut in. Help us to be good neighbors. Help the world to see... Uh, that we are Christians by our love one for another. We ask that you bless the message as we hear it. Help us help this to be a blessing as we continue to learn uh, about the early church from the book of Acts. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, if you please would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. We are continuing our series through the book of Acts. Uh, if you remember, the key verse in the book of Acts is Acts 1.8. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And that's going to be the layout of the book as we go through it. We are still in the early portion of the book, focusing primarily on Judea. If you remember in the early uh, chapter, the first chapter, we saw Jesus ascend into heaven. They, the, the apostles replaced Judas with Matthias. And then in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down, baptizes everyone, and then fills them, and that's the beginning of the church. And we've been following the progress of the church ever since then. In Acts 3, Peter and John go into the temple. They heal a lame man. In Acts 3 and 4 is the interaction um, with the healing of the lame man, how the religious leaders responded, how the people responded. By the time you get to the end of chapter 4, you're going to have 5,000 people being saved. You're going to have um, people fearing and respecting the Lord because they see how uh, how he's working. 
And then when we, last week when we looked at chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, we saw hypocrisy come into the church from the inside as God judged Ananias and Sapphira for their uh, lying to the Holy Spirit and trying to give uh, in a way that was bringing attention to themselves rather than glory to God. From the rest, from chapter 5 all the way to uh, chapter 7, from this point on, we're going to see uh, intense persecution begin to build up against the church, uh, culminating with the martyrdom of Stephen. It's really important to understand that our faith is not a private faith. Jesus was publicly executed in front of everyone. All saw him. He was publicly humiliated. And you, uh, it, you know, it, it was kind of like no one could, no one did not, there was no one who did not know that what, what happened to Jesus. It wasn't done in secret. And then when he rose, he publicly showed himself to many witnesses and publicly commissioned his church to go out and to spread the gospel. And that's what Peter and John and the early believers have been doing. So what I want to start this week and probably next week and possibly into the following week, uh, I've entitled this message, Your Response to Ministry Re Reveals Your Heart for the Master. Your response to ministry reveals your heart for the master. And we're going to be reading Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 42. Please join me, follow along as I do that. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple, speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely, and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one of the councils stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many of the people 
after him. He also perished, and all who diso- excuse me, all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it's of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him, and when they called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That is a long passage, and we're going to take it as a, as a whole, but obviously it's going to take us a couple, maybe three weeks to get through. As I mentioned earlier, um, the gospel ministry is a public ministry, and a public ministry blesses some, but it also entices or angers others. And so I want to look at three effects of the gospel as we work through this passage. Um, tonight, we're going to look at enriching the poor in spirit from Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. Then we're going to see enraging the proud in verses 17 to 40. And then finally energizing the persecuted in verses 41 and 42. If you remember from chapter 2, we found out when the Spirit fills up a church, the church is unified, it's magnified, and it begins to multiply. Satan wants just the opposite to happen. He wants to divide the church, he wants to disgrace the church, and he wants to decrease the church. And he will if we let him. This pandemic is an opportunity for us to grow the church uh, and, and to grow and encourage one another. So it, it's really important that we don't let circumstances control us. And we see Peter and John not letting the circumstances of being in jail, of being persecuted, can keep them from doing what God commanded them to do. Here we see the church is not divided, disgraced, and decreased. It's going to triumphantly um, conquer Satan's temptation here. Remember last week we looked at the uh, inner temptation from Ananias and Sapphira, and now we're going to look at outward persecution from the leaders. And what's going to happen, if you look at verse 12, they're still unified. If you look at verse 13, the Lord is magnified. If you look at verse, verse 14, it says men and women were added, multitudes were added to the church. This is the first time the mention of women happens in the book of Acts. If you remember when we went through Luke, Luke emphasized the importance of women repeatedly. Um, there are at least a dozen references in the book of Acts to women. And Luke is going to show later on a key role that women play in the church. But here we see that God saves both men and women. Now, who are the people that receive the blessings of gospel ministry? Remember I said today we're looking at enriching the poor in spirit. Those who are poor in spirit, those are the ones who take the gospel and do something with it. If you remember back in... Matthew, I think it's chapter 4, when Jesus was um, getting, before he did the Beatitudes in chapters 5 and 6, the Bible says this about him. And Jesus went about all of Galilee. He taught in their synagogues, preached the gospel, the kingdom, healed all kinds of diseases uh, among the people. And then his fame went throughout all of Syria. And so people began to bring to him all the sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And then the Bible says great multitudes followed him. From Galilee, which is in the north, from the Capitalists, which is on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, Jerusalem, which is south, and Judea, which is also south, and from beyond the Jordan, which is east of the Jordan River. Once the word got out, a lot of people began to follow Jesus. And then Jesus, after he does all this, preaches a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, and he starts the Sermon on the Mount with this line, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Chapter 5, verse 3. So who benefits from Jesus' grace and power? Who are those who are enriched? It's the humble. It's the poor in spirit. It's the desperate. It's those who see themselves as sinners. Those who see themselves as lacking God's grace and not able to, to um, do anything to earn his salvation. And that's what we see here also in Acts 5. Um, Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we approach God as being those who are poor in spirit, as we're going to see here, or are we going to approach Jesus in what I would call a middle-class spirit, as if we can take care of ourselves without him, but are nonetheless hoping for his assistance as a backup plan? This pandemic 
is good in the, in the way that it teaches us that without him we can do nothing, and God can change our world very quickly. And many are beginning to realize they're not in control. A lot of the panic buying is happening because people are scared of the future, so they're just grabbing things. Christians should be the opposite. We shouldn't be hoarded. We, we should be giving because we know that God richly provides for those who seek first his kingdom. And so we want to come to the Lord as poor in spirit, not middle class in spirit, or even worse, rich in spirit, or arrogant or proud. And we're going to see that in the next time that, that we meet in verses 17 to 40, among the leaders of the people who knew the Bible inside and out, and yet they were so arrogant that they stopped, the, they tried to stop the message of the gospel from being preached, thinking they were actually serving God and they were doing the exact opposite. Now you'll notice the apostles here didn't develop a business plan, didn't get a vision committee together, a military strategy, um, and get all the influential people and then expect the gospel to do trickling down to others. What they did was a compassion strategy, just like Jesus did. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, he preached in their synagogues, he healed their people, and the people were bringing the sick, and then he told the disciples, remember in Matthew 9, the harvest is plenty as the laborers are few, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send laborers into the, his harvest, and we see that's exactly what's going on here. And the early apostles did what Jesus did. They reached out to the marginalized, those who knew that they were poor in spirit, the social fringes, the, the most needy people. And so we must be committed to getting the gospel message to everyone. Some people will respond in faith. Some people will respond in ridicule. Some will totally ignore. Uh, and as we go through this time, uh, we need to not think about ourselves, but others. Are we moved to feed, clothe, and teach the multitudes who have no shepherd? What a great time to get the gospel out to people that they can understand that there's a Lord in heaven who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and doesn't even let a sparrow fall without his knowing it. And we are of so much more value than a sparrow. Read Luke chapter 12 for more on that. So how does the gospel ministry enrich the poor in spirit? I think there's at least two ways. First is going to be purity, and, and the second is going to be power. And we're going to focus in just today on verses 12 to 16. So the purity is from uh, 12b through 14. Um, and the Bible says this, uh, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Um, in order to be useful to the Lord, the church had to be pure. You notice the Lord in, the Latin, in verses 1 to 11, he purified the church by ridding them of Ananias and Sapphira. He takes purity very seriously. Paul writes to Timothy and says this to, to him in 2 Timothy 2, 19 to 21. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. That should be our heart. We should want to be purified. And you see this with the church here. The, 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 the apostles in, in, in the first part of that verse uh, were able to do many signs and wonders. They were able to preach the gospel. Why? Because they had pure hearts. If they had impure hearts, the last thing they would have been thinking about was serving the Lord. They would have been thinking about serving themselves. John MacArthur writes in his commentary on this about the 19th century Scottish pastor and evangelist named Robert Murray McShane. And Mr. McShane gave the following advice to young men who were entering the ministry. He says, do not forget the culture of the inner man. I mean the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer, cavalry, I shouldn't say cavalry, cavalry officer, keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember, you are God's sword, his instrument. I trust a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfections of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hands of God. And Mr. McShane is exactly right. And the early disciples modeled this for us. If each individual 
believer stays pure, then the church can be pure collectively. And if we want to reach the world, we can't be like the world. We want to be different than the world. And, and we must deal with things called sin. Uh, as we saw God dealing out last week with Ananias and Sapphira, um, it's really important that church discipline is practiced. And church discipline is not us trying to f make ourselves look better by putting someone else down when we see them in sin. Church discipline, uh, in love, we're going to go, uh, like Galatians says, when you see someone overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore that person in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Our goal is restoration, not condemnation. And if we love someone, we, we want what's best for them and who they represent. It's because God loves us that he chastens us, Hebrews 12 says. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges. If you're without chastisement, you're not one of his. All the way through the New Testament, you're going to see the importance of confronting sin. We live in a society that doesn't like this. We live in a society that says, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and don't be judgmental. But here's what God says in Luke 17, 3. Jesus commands, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Paul told Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy 1.20 to put Hymenaeus and Alexandria, excuse me, Alexander out of the Ephesian church because they were blaspheming. He commanded the Corinthians to remove from their fellowship a man of gross immorality. You can read that, that story in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the first seven verses. He told Titus to reprove believers severely that they may be sound in the faith, Titus 1.13. Even church leaders are not exempt from public rebuke, 1 Timothy 5.20. And Peter and had that happen to him when Paul rebuked him in Galatians chapter 2. Even pastors going to be uh, preached this morning on, on Matthew 16. Two chapters later in Matthew 18, uh, Jesus talks about, he's the one who established church discipline in Matthew 18. He says, if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. If he does not listen to you, take two or three with you. So that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What's, why is Jesus saying this? This is not an option. This is an obligation. This is a command of God. Just like repent and believe the gospel is a command of God. The church must take purity Seriously, so verse 12b through 14 are a parentheses. If you look at the f beginning of chapter 12, excuse me, verse 12, it says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done am among the people. And if you drop down to verse 15, there's like a big parentheses there. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. In between there, there's like a big parenthetical statement um, that is the subject of purity in the church. That's the importance here. Um, it, it, by the way, they're going into Solomon's porch. You might be familiar with that. Remember in chapter 3, that's where he healed the man who was uh, brought up there every day who was lame. And so that's something that it was a place that people regularly gathered and would come in. And notice here in, verses, in verse 13, it says, uh, and this is a paradoxical truth, none of the rest of the unbelievers dared to associate with the believers but they were, even though they were held in high esteem, it says none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. So they, the fear of God came upon them in such a way that they, they feared God and the people enough to respect them, but not enough to submit to the Lord. Even, even the unsaved people had that basic knowledge. I wish that they feared the Lord enough to submit to him and to repent. But God used his fear upon those people to at least give the apostles respect. Um, and that happened because sin was dealt with swiftly in the church. In fact, I would argue that discipline is essential to evangelism because it purifies the church, the people in the church, and keeps the shallow and the curious away. And those uh, on the outside realize that the church is serious about sin. This is, and because of this purity, God was able to grow the church. The second thing, and we see at the beginning of verse 12 and verses 15 and 16 here, is power. See, because there was purity, there was power. Uh, and remember, I, we've already talked about the signs and wonders in the past. This is a unique apostolic power. Only a, the apostles were given this gift by the Lord. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, where it says the signs of an apostle were done among you. Here we see 
through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. They were God's messengers. The, the, the ability to do those signs and wonders authenticated who they were. They were standing for God. But the miracles weren't the end. They were a means to the end. The end was the gospel itself. The end was salvation. What good is it to heal a person and then they die and go to hell? So the goal was for them to see that the apostles were who they said they were. And the goal was for them, to, because of those miracles, to take the message more seriously. If they took the message more seriously, they would take the, the God of the message more seriously, and hopefully they would repent. So this is something that Luke notes. Um, the early church was not a miracle-working church. It was a church with miracle-working apostles. And if you remember their prayer at the end of chapter 4, verses 29 and 30, Now, Lord, look on their threats. Grant to your servants with that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And then they pray, and in the next chapter we see God answering their prayer. Another reason I know their, their hearts are right and that they are pure, as Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But God did hear them, which proves that they were really saved and that they were walking with the Lord. And this is really interesting because now the word's getting out and they're bringing everybody from all over the place and on beds and couches. Beds are like small little uh, beds and couches are the straw mattress that the, the poor would carry around with them. And both of these terms imply that Luke was healing both the rich and the poor. It was, the, these miracles weren't just for one class or for another class. The people who were poor in spirit were not skeptical of the Lord. They were not skeptical of the Lord's messengers. And they were not skeptical of the Lord's message. In fact, they were so believing in it, they would actually bring people and hope that Peter's shadow would heal them. Now, the Bible doesn't say whether that actually worked or not. It just mentions that was their belief. And the stir caused by the massive number of the apostles' healings was not limited to Jerusalem. It got out to Judea and to Samaria and all the areas uh, around about. And as we close up this message, the big idea here, and it's something that we need to take very seriously, is that those who come to the Lord, poor in spirit, are enriched. How do you know you're poor in spirit? You are purified. The church comes in such a way that they con confess their own sins. They don't tolerate sin. They approach people who are in sin with love and respect, trying to help them to recover from that, to restore them. And then they have power. Now, we don't, we, we don't have the same miraculous power, but we can still pray and we can still serve. Next week, we're going to look at verses 17 to 42, and we'll look at the last two points in this thing. It's a long passage, but it's a pretty easy uh, narrative to understand. And we're going to see... Uh, Sometimes when people hear the gospel, it enrages them because they're proud. They're not poor in spirit. They're rich in spirit. And then we're going to see how it helps those who are his believers to go out there and to continue to get the message out. Let's close in prayer. And by the way, thank you for joining us online. And, and I want to pray, and then I want to give you a quick little announcement about um, next week's stuff. Lord, thank you for your word and the ability to hear your word. Lord, pray that you would work in our hearts, help us to be poor in spirit, not middle class or rich in spirit. And thank you that the gospel enriches us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Quick little announcement. So you can hear the Sunday morning and the Sunday evening services on Facebook. On, on Sunday morning, they'll, they'll be available at 9 a.m. And you can watch that anytime. It'll be on Facebook, our Center View page. Or you can go to the website. If you click on the part where it says Listen Online, you can click on that. Click on the current sermon. And what you'll see is an audio or a visual so you can either watch it or you can listen to it like you've al we've always had the, the ability to do. And once we posted that, that's, that stays permanent. Your Sunday school classes are time sensitive. So your Sunday school classes are live. And so please, uh, if your teacher sends you a thing, we're starting at 9.15 or we're starting at 10.45, zoom in on those classes, do that, and then you can watch the, the message on your own. In the coming weeks, we're going to send you out some short video clips. Um, just to be an encouragement, I'm going to try to post regularly some quick devotional thoughts. We are here to help. Uh, the church is not the building. The church are the people uh, that belong here in this family of faith. So let's use this time as an opportunity to grow in our, our, uh, 
our love for the Lord. We have some more time to spend with our families. And we have some opportunities to serve our neighbors. Thank you.